And this is a highlight. You've heard me say this before. And the reason it's a highlight is because this is a place where we come together to celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. The fact that Jesus died on the cross for us. And we come here to celebrate with people who say, I love Jesus. We celebrate with people who have said, Jesus is the Lord of my life. We believe in believer's baptism. We don't baptize people before we, they believe. We baptize people after they believe as a sign of their faith. And if you've been baptized before, I want to remind you of your baptism and take joy in that, remember that. If you have not yet been baptized, I encourage you uh, to come talk to us to let us know that you're interested and you're going to hear about C2 cards. You can write that on the card. This is a time of worship, a time of celebration. You read the book of Acts and every time they come to Christ, it says they came to Christ and were baptized. And this is what we do here uh, this morning. We have two young ladies coming this morning for baptism. And uh, the first one is Julianne Pruitt. Would you please welcome her with me? <laughs> Julianne, what is your confession of faith? Amen. Because Jesus is Lord of your life, who baptized you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are buried with him in baptism. We are raised to walk in the newness of life. Woo! Rihanna, Duke, come on down. We want to welcome Rihanna. And I wonder, a wonderful thing, Julianne called me and said, I want to come talk to you about baptism. And I said, that's awesome. Come on in. And when she showed up, Rihanna was with her. And I said, that's double awesome because as friends, let's go ahead and stand in there. Uh, you're getting real tall on me. Go ahead and stand right down there. <laughs> I might drop you if you get up that high. So, Rihanna, what is your confession of faith? Amen. Because Jesus is Lord of your life, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are buried with him in baptism. We are raised to walk in the newness of life. It's a wonderful thing to worship, stand and worship God. God, we thank you for telling us through the gospel of how much you love us. God, we thank you for what you have done for us, gracious Father. Father, we call upon you as our heavenly Father to, to come into this place, to the presence of your spirit, so that we may be crafted in to the men and women and young people that you have called us to be. God, we know the power of your word, so as we turn to it, as we open the words and read them that you have inspired, we pray that we would hear directly from you. God, I pray that you'd speak through me and help us to encounter you in your glory today. God, I thank you for each person in this room. Help us to recall with joy the love you have for us. God, I pray for the women that are at victory right now. I just pray as they worship together, as they, they share communion, as they gather in that place together, watch over them as well. God, I pray that we would be sensitive to your spirit, that we would be open to your guidance. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Speakers of the English language often confuse two words, uh, the word good and the word well. The word good and the word well. And what I want us to do today as we close out this series through 1 Thessalonians is to look at the good which God calls us to do well. To look at those things that are crafted for us to do and we are crafted in order to accomplish. God has told us very clearly that before the creation of all things, that God has set in motion things as they should be. There, there is no plan B. There's no surprise to God. God in his eternal presence, God in his all being, God in all of his knowledge says to us that I have created all things. Through me all things are created, including you. And he says that you have been created with a purpose. You've been created with things to do. And one of the things that we're going to find at the close of First Thessalonians are some things that you and I are called to do. I'm going to come back to this later at the later part of this message, but I want you to hear this at the beginning so you get it on the bookends of the message. And here is what I want you to hear. So many times we ask this question, what does God want me to do? And we're waiting for this huge answer. We're looking for the skies to open and God to say in a, in a very James Earl Jones voice, this is what you are supposed to do. 
And maybe you've been fortunate enough to have that experience, but most people do not have that experience. But we have the scripture to tell us what we are to do. And so I want us to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to close out the book today, uh, beginning in verse 12. And he does a wonderful job, mainly Paul again, if you remember. He has some help with Paul and Silas, uh, Timothy and Silas, but mainly Paul writes to us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Now, we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong. But always strive to do what is good for each other for and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you as faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. If you recall the great synopsis Jesus gives us of all of the commands of the Old Testament and all the continued message of God's plan for us, he answers the young scholar. He says, here's what you are to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What we find here in Thessalonians is Paul picking up that same theme and saying, here is what you're to do. You're to love God and you're to love your neighbor. And he spends most of the time talking about how we are to love our neighbors. And I want you to notice here that he is mainly referring to our Christian neighbors, to the people within our fellowship of faith. That is not to say, as you see, he says everyone. He does include everyone else, but he begins within the church. Why is that? He begins within the church because if we cannot figure out how to treat each other well in the church, we're not going to do a very good job at that outside the church. If we can't figure out how to have good and healthy relationships within this place where we all share the same Lord, we're going to have a hard time out in the world loving those people. So he says, find this love close to home. Make it a part of who you are. And what he begins with is this idea of holding those who are serving you in a place of honor, holding those who are pastoring you, holding those who are teaching you in high regard. And he, he tells us why. But let me first give you a word you're going to find, particularly in Peter he uses this word, but it's a Greek word meaning poemen. Poemen. Uh, we take that word and eventually end up with pastor. Where it actually began is the word shepherd. Poemen means the word shepherd. And so by definition, by the Greek definition, the word poemen means a person who is leading a church a person who is pastoring a church is to shepherd the sheep, is to guide the sheep. And here are two ways specifically I want to begin with that he says the pastors are to do, that the people who teach, that the people who are instructed to lead the church, what they are to do. And the first one we see is this word care. Hold them in high regard for their love. And before that it says they work hard among you who care for you. This is a wonderful illustration of a shepherd. The care, because without a shepherd, the sheep get confused, the sheep get lost, the sheep don't know where to go. And, and God is saying to us, we need guidance, we need the great experience of what it means to do life together. And the way that happens is the great shepherd, again, go to Peter and read this later, First Peter, as you look at the great shepherd, the good shepherd, God himself shepherds those who are to shepherd, and here is the first thing they are to do, and that is to care for the people. My responsibility as lead pastor and one of the pastors here is to care for the people. And, and we have pastors who are called to care for your teenagers and care for your children and care for the couples. And we do this through small group. We do this through ministries. We do this by telling you this is where we believe God is leading this church. These are the ways that he is saying 
Make this something that you respect. Make this something that you honor. And this is a wonderful thing that he tells everyone. I remember as a, as a child, all the way into my teens, I had the same pastor. I still consider him my pastor. And one of the things that I greatly honor about this man, still to this day, is he is a man of integrity. He's a man of great integrity. And I've told you before that that is what we are called to be. You are called to be as well. But Scripture is very clear. Those who teach are called to a higher accountability. And therefore, we must be people of integrity. So you can expect that from us, that we need to be people of integrity. Your pastors need to be people of integrity. Because we look at this passage, it says you are to hold the pastors in high regard. Well, that's hard to do when the person is not of integrity. And so that is the challenge before us at all times. And therefore, he says sometimes this is going to be a difficult and where he does this as he says the word admonish, as they care and admonish you. Now, think, think of this example as parenting. Uh, some, some of you find it difficult to admonish your children. But what does that mean? Sometimes we get this word admonish and, and it terrifies us. It, it sets us going the different directions because we're not quite sure, quite sure what to do with it. But you take the word admonish in the, in the Greek version, there are two words it comes, that come together to make the word which we make out of that admonish. The two words in Greek that come together are to put and mind. To put and mind. Therefore, to admonish is to put before the mind. In other words, to bring your, to your attention, attention. This is a very important thing for us to understand. Because if we are going to ever understand those things in our lives that need to change, someone has to bring them to our mind. And in the church setting, that is to be your pastors, that is to be your small group leader, that is to be your brother or sister in Christ, where someone comes to you and says, brother, sister, listen, this is something that's going on in your world. This is something that needs to change. And we've talked about this before, that everyone needs one of those in your life. That everybody needs that. If you haven't found a person in your life who's willing to come to you and say, brother, you have missed it on that one. Sister, that was not a wise choice. You need that on a whole scale. We need to clearly open the word of God and read it and preach from it. But you also need it on a more intimate level. You need a person, whether you're in your small group or a person that you have grown close to within the church that you trust, or you can have what we call a Paul in your life, a person that says, look, you've steered, you've steered the wrong way here. Let me help you steer back. And that is the point of admonish, particularly when it goes with care. Our, our staff is reading a book right now, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And, and it, it's not a faith book. It's just really a, a book on leadership and planning and vision. And, and as we're reading this, I, I came across this paragraph, and I want to share with you in the context of admonish. In the context of admonish, it says this, what's needed is a slight tweak in our mindset for accepting other people's comments. My friend Chris Cabby, an expert in executive learning, has a saying that puts this into perspective for me. No matter what someone tells him, he accepts it by reminding himself, I won't learn less. What does mean, what, what that means is that some, when somebody makes a suggestion or gives you ideas, you're either going to learn more or learn nothing, but you're not going to learn less. Hearing people out does not make you dumber, so thank them for trying to help. I, I love this idea that everything that we hear, Everything that we hear can be taken in. And some things we can say, well, thank you, I already knew that. That's where we learn nothing. Or some we can say, well, I've learned something new. Perhaps I've even learned that maybe this person just wants to help. But that puts a whole new perspective on the conversations that we have. That the civility that we can have in all conversations, we're willing to listen to others, to have people admonish us. And so he goes on to say five specific things in this text that can help us with relationships. Because if we're going to be the people that share these relationships that are healthy, particularly within the Christian church, we need to say, okay, God's told me to love my neighbor. Clearly. And I'm supposed to love my neighbor because I love my God, and God loves my neighbor. So if I'm going to love God and God loves my neighbor, it makes a whole lot of sense, and I need to love my neighbor too. And so what we're going to find here is five specific things that he calls us to do. And, and the first one you see in latter part of 13 says this, live in peace with each other. Live in peace with each other. What does that look like? What does that actually look like? 
What it looks like is respecting one another. What that looks like is saying, yes, I may disagree with you on this, but it's okay because you're my brother, you're my sister. It is a way in which we come together and say, here is our commonality. Here is our commonality. If we are living by the word of God together, then that can help us find peace. I want to remind you of a verse that we came across just last week, chapter 4, verse 11. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you. That is one way to keep the peace. We have a, a my, my wife and I, Vonda Kay and I, have a great thing that we try to teach our kids. Have you ever had one of those times where mealtime is just more disruptive than peaceful? Right? You're like, wow, we get family time, we get to sit down for a meal, and then you, everything's going well, and then someone's like, stop smacking. Or, you're not eating that right, et cetera. Now, where does that come from? It comes from the person looking at what the other person is doing rather than focusing on their own meal. And I want you to use that illustration. Some of us look for people who are smacking. I know my kids do this. I don't think they're in the room, right? They're not in the room yet. So I can talk about them. No, but in all, in all seriousness, I, it is a time where we say, look, if you will focus on your own person, if you focus on your own actions, you won't be distracted by other people. And some of us within the church and outside the church, we just keep looking for people who are smacking so we can point out they're smacking. Or we look for people that are doing something to irritate us so that we can sa- simply say to them, you irritate me. It's like we're looking around, whether it be on Facebook or across the room in your office or in your own home. You're like, I can't wait to call them out on this. I can't wait to call them out on this. That is not peace. That's not peace. We're looking for weapons. We're looking for things to throw. And that is not living at peace. It's able to you know, mind your own business. I'm surprised the Bible even says that. I'm so glad it does. Mind your own business. First thing we are is to live at peace. Second thing we are to do is to warn, to warn. I want us to look at this verse together. In chapter 5, verse 14, admonish under the, under the whole direction of admonish and care. Now we've gone from the pastors to the church to all the church doing this together. And first is all the church loving each other and living together in peace. And the second thing is warning. Verse 14, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, time out. Brothers and sisters, who is he talking to? This is key. He's talking to fellow believers, talking to the church. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage is heartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Why is that important? It's important because we can look upon people in our own fellowship. Keep in mind, this is own fellowship. We mind our own business. Yet within the context of church, within the context of church faith community, we have been called to warn each other. Not to threaten one another, not, not to call one out in order to shame another, but if you see a brother and sister walking away, walking away from the scriptural path, walking away from what it means to follow Jesus, you are to warn them. What is a warning? I want you to picture, you're on a road. And there's a big sign, cliff ahead, cliff ahead, sharp turn. What happens if there's a cliff ahead and a sharp turn and there's no sign there? Not good, right? A warning actually put there in order to keep you safe. And this is what he's talking about. It's you're saying, brother, brother, look, that thing you're doing, you're going to run off the road. You are going to derail your life. You know that woman you're spending too much time with that's not your spouse? Not a good idea. You know you have no integrity on that computer, and I know what you've done before on that computer. Let's put some safeguards. You know that person you just keep smack talking just because you think it's fun? I think that's going to lead to anger. You talk to your brother, you talk to your sister, not out of anger, not out of a desire to hurt, but saying, hey, there's a steep Cliff ahead, I want you to stay off of it. 1 Corinthians 5. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. What's he saying here? You've you've heard the phrase, outside the church or within the church, don't judge. Don't judge. 
That is partially, partially correct. Let's look at that verse again. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Paul's saying, Christians, okay, that's one thing. Non-Christians, people inside the church, I don't have a right to judge them. They're not living like God, nor should they expect it to be living like God because they don't love God. They don't follow God. But here's the second sentence that may catch you off guard if you've always heard the word do not judge. Read it out loud. Okay, are you not to judge those inside? You are to judge. Scripture's telling you this. You are to judge the behavior, keep this in mind, the behavior of people within the body of Christ. Why? Because the standard is set. We are to be like Christ. I can't expect people on the outside to be like Christ, but I am to expect of myself, go back to the word of integrity I said earlier, and I'm to expect of you and you're to expect of me and you're to expect of one another the lifestyle that says Jesus is Lord. I've been baptized into his name. I love the Lord my God. I sing to the Lord my God. Therefore, we need to live to the Lord our God. And what he's saying here is make sure you know each other well enough that you can personally go in and say, I'm warning you, brother. I'm warning you, sister. There's danger ahead. There's danger ahead. So what does this mean? It means that we do things around the church that helps with this. For example, if, if someone is going to teach a small group, we want to make sure that they're members of the church. Which, If you're a member of the church, you've agreed to live by a certain lifestyle. You've agreed to say, I want to live in a way that is biblical. If someone is going to be a teacher or volunteer in our children, we do background checks to say, is there something in their life that should prevent them from doing this? If you're going to be a volunteer in the youth group, Corey's going to talk to you and see where you are in your world and say, you know what, it may be a great time for you to lead. Or, you know what, maybe you need to observe first because there's some things you've got to deal with. We have to be able to say, I am putting people into a place of teaching, putting in a person in a place of leadership. That person needs to live like God has called them to live. Then this third one, I love it. It's very simple. And that is to help one another, to help one another. Now, one of the ways we help is, is to live in peace and to warn, but just a general help. I hope you have people, particularly in your small group. We talked about this last week. This is the main way we do this. Well, you can call someone and say, you know what? I am in need. I need help. I need help. And this can be, I need help moving. This can be, I need help because my spouse is in the hospital and could you provide some food? Or this is help. Can you just be an ear for me? Can you just sit down and hear me out? I need some counsel. Help one another. And then there's one that none of us like a whole lot, and this is be patient. Be patient. But I want you to notice a word in this. Two words, actually. Be patient with everybody. He's going to later say rejoice always. We're going to get to that. But before that, he says be patient with everybody. Now, we would all agree there are some people that are more difficult to be around, the people that are more difficult to have patience with just because of the way they're wired and the way you're, rewi- you're wired and they just don't wire together very well. But God says we are to be patient with everybody. And then he goes on to say one fifth thing. And here's one that I said earlier we need to do well, those good things. We need to do the good well. Well, one of the things he calls us to do well is the good of saying, I'm going to make a good choice here when someone harms me. I'm going to make a good choice here when someone does me wrong. I'm going to make a good choice here when things don't go the way I wish they would go. Look at verse 15. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. You may want to highlight, you may want to memorize, you may want to write down, you may want to underline. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Jesus took eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and flipped it on its head. I said, I tell you what, you are to forgive. You're to forgive. You're to forgive. You're to forgive. You're to forgive. I want you to picture the scene. Peter, the great disciple, the fisherman turned fisher of men. He's in a tradition, Jewish tradition, 
that says you are to forgive up to three, maybe four times. And if you give up to four times, man, you, you are just flying off the charts in forgiveness. You, you're doing so well. One strike. I remember the story about baseball. I don't know. But the Jewish tradition of the day was, man, if I'll forgive somebody three times, I'm saintly. Look up Amos. You want to find that? Go read Amos if you can find it. Uh, some of you got that joke. But you, you have the, these three forgivenesses, if you will. And so Peter says, let me tell you what. Let me tell you, Jesus, how forgiving I am. Matthew 18, 18 verse 21. And Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And then he's about to impress Jesus. He is going to impress the socks off or sandals off Jesus, right? He, he's about to just bring, he's, he's going to double plus. He's supposed to give, forgive three times. And check out what he says. He says up to seven times. Like, wow, aren't you impressed, Jesus? I am going to forgive that jerk seven times. And his, his little party lasts about that long. Next verse. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Some translations say 70 times seven. They disagree on which. But regardless of whether it is 77 times or 490 times. Jesus is not doing math. Jesus is using seven, a wonderful biblical number, uh, of saying that this is to go on and on and on and on. If you're going to be like Christ, you need to forgive. It doesn't necessarily mean put yourself in a dangerous position 77 times, but what it means is you are going to forgive Forgive, forgive. I came across this quote recent, recently, and I love it. And he says, forgiveness is giving up on wanting a better past. Forgiving, forgiveness is giving up on wanting a better past. You see, some of us can't forgive because of something happened in the past. Well, guess what? We not, we're not going to change that. I cannot change the past. I have hurt people, and people have hurt me. And I say, you know what, I, I would do anything if I could undo that. How many of you have said that? I would do anything, and I guarantee you most people, unless they're just absolute jerks, wish they would undo the things they've done before too. And, and Jesus says, forgive, 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 forgive. And then he says this here, in 1 Thessalonians. They continue on, and he says this, rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I told you at the beginning I was going to say things twice when it came to this, and I want to say it again, as I said I would, because this is important. Because so many of us ask this question a lot. Maybe the most commonly asked question particularly of those who are trying to figure out if they even want in on this Christian thing, if they want to be a part of the faith journey of Jesus, is why does God allow these bad things to happen? That's usually question number one. And we can unpack that and deal with that later, not today. But, but I want us to go to question number two. I'm not done a poll. I, I don't know for sure these are the top two questions, but just from experience, pastoral experience, I think the top two questions that are asked are why does God allow difficult things to happen and what does God want me to do with my life? Number two, what does God want me to do with my life? And like I said earlier, what many of us are saying when we're asking that second question is, God, could you map out the next 30 years? God, could you tell me what I'm supposed to do? Can you tell me if I'm on the right track? Can you tell me if I go to this college that it's actually the right college? Can you tell me if I major in this and I'm actually going to be still majoring in that four years from now? Can you tell me if, you know, I'm 59 and I'm thinking about retiring, but should I? You know what, I'm 75 and I haven't retired yet, and maybe I should retire now. Or, you know, God, I think I'm supposed to move, but I'm not really sure I'm supposed to move. And I said, 
and I've experienced this, is sometimes God does something absolutely amazing and says yes or no or go this way or go that way. But it's been my experience, and I bet it's been your experience, that a lot of times you're not here in very specific directions. And so here's what I want to say to you. I want to say to you that as you are praying, God, what is your will, you look at the scripture and see what his will is. Check it out again. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Okay, here, this is not rhetorical. Say the last part of that verse again. For this. For this is God's will for you. That's the question. What's God's will for me? Well, part of it is rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. And then he goes on. I'm going to go back to the text here in a minute. Because he said, I want you to rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. And then he says, but I know, and I'm adding here a little bit, but I think his thought pattern goes like this. He goes, okay, I've just told them to do these three things, but I also know there are times when people need a more direct answer. How does he do that? How does he do this? Well, this very next verse is fascinating. And I want to set up the verse with a little background. The background is this. These people, as you've heard the last few weeks, are brand new Christians. They're very early church. Most of them, Gentiles, have no background in Jewish history. They just have heard the gospel. They believe it. They've been baptized. And they're trying to do this church thing. And they are being told lots of things, some of them true, some of them not. And one of the things they begin to hear is this teaching of the Holy Spirit. What are we to do with the Holy Spirit? And they've been taught very very carefully and very intentionally by Paul, that you need to study the Scriptures. But what they're doing is some of them are saying, well, I think God's speaking to me in a special way, but I'm not sure what to do with it. So here's where he goes with this. He says, verse, uh, verse 19, it says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Now, the last part is so important because we have to reject every evil because sometimes we can't hear God because we're in the midst of evil. Evil is blaring so loudly in our ears that whatever yuck you, you won't let go of, it's hard to hear God. It's hard to hear God with your fingers in your ears, and our fingers are in our ears when we say, you know, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So you need to get rid of that and hold on to what is good, and then you're going to be able to go back and actually hear something. Do not quench the spirit. What's going on is people are coming to the church and saying, the spirit of God has told me. The spirit of God has shared with me. And he does a wise counsel. He says, don't just just say, ah, forget you. That's too weird. That's too hocus pocus. No, I, I don't believe that. But he also says, test it. Test it. And so we need to honor it and we need to test it. We need to honor it and we need to test it. I go back to that admonish and warn. Sometimes people are going to come to you and say, the spirit of God has told me, blank. The Spirit of God has told me blank. The Spirit of God has told me blank. And here is your responsibility. First thing is be open to it. The second thing is to test it. And so if, if they say, the Spirit of God has told me that you need to buy me a brand new car, what should you do with that one? Probably go back and test and say, you know, I don't think I've been called to buy you a brand new car. But hey, the Spirit of God has told me you're struggling with this sin and I'm here to help you, that's probably from the Spirit of God. And those are just silly examples and far-fetched in many ways, particularly the car. But I want you to hear this, that you are to listen to the Spirit because sometimes the way God is going, God is going to actually speak to you is through Scripture and through a fellow believer who says, God just laid this on my heart, let me share it with you. And then the way they wrap this whole letter up is with this beautiful prayer. And so I want to wrap up this whole series with the same prayer, the same benediction, the same blessing with which they closed the letter. So hear this prayer over you. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. I pray that today we would be filled with that presence, that we would be open to your spirit, and that we would 
do well in doing the good. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.